16, starting at verse 25. I ask you to go back and read the whole chapter, particularly starting at verse uh, 14 and 40. That'll give you the whole story. Acts chapter 16, starting at verse 25. And it reads, But at midnight, Paul and Silas was praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners was listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's chains were loosened. And the keeper of the prison awakened from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice, saying, Do yourself no harm, for we are here. Then he called for the light rain and fell down trembling before Paul in silence. And brought, and he brought them out and said, Sir, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, and your household. Amen. 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 People, I come out here to tell you today that no matter what situation you in, instead of using your time to mourn and moan and complain about your issues, spend your time praising God. Instead of using your time to complain about your problems, spend your time praising and worshiping God. Amen. Paul and Silas was locked up in prison. And God, also, not only did he break the chains, somebody else got saved on that day. So use your time to praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
Good morning, family. I'm standing this morning in the pulpit of my church and your church, Bible Way Community Baptist Church. I'm standing here this morning because I wanted to start bringing us back to church. I wanted us to start thinking about coming back to church. Uh, hopefully it won't be long before all of us are back in our lovely sanctuary, worshiping our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, I want to bring to you a message taken again out of the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 17. And I want to talk about a nation with a troubled heart, a nation with a troubled heart. A man is only as good as his heart. I say a man is only as good as his heart. If a man has a compassionate heart and a kind heart, then that's a good man. If a man has a wicked heart, a rebellious heart, then that's a bad man. See, a man is only as good as his heart. In the same way, a nation is only as good as its people's heart. When we look at our text here in Jeremiah chapter 17, we will see a nation with a trouble heart. As a matter of fact, uh, Jeremiah is the weeping prophet, and Jeremiah, uh, he's agonizing over why, oh, why, God, must you uh, judge the children of Judah? And God pointed out in uh, Jeremiah 17 that Judah has a troubled heart. As a matter of fact, he's going to show us three kinds of hearts that Judah has. And all three of these hearts are a troubled heart. They are bad hearts. Look, look, look here at verse number one. He says, the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond. It is engraved upon the t t tables of their heart. Did you notice that? Their heart upon the horn of your altar. First of all, we see a nation with a sinful heart. A nation with a sinful heart. Notice God says the sin of Judah. Notice it's singular. He says the sin. What was the number one sin of the children of Judah? It was the sin of idolatry. It was the sin of putting something else ahead of God. You know, the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments deals with idolatry. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And thou shalt not make any graven image of any kind of God. And so uh, this was Judah's problem. Judah's problem is they had a problem of idolatry, the sin of idolatry. And the thing about the sin of idolatry is you will break all of the other Ten Commandments in order to get to your idol. You will steal, you will kill. Uh, you would disrespect your mama. You would curse folks out in order to get to your idol. Well, that's what was happening in Jeremiah day. These people, because they had the sin of idolatry, then they was breaking all of the other uh, commandments of God. And notice what God said that he was going to do. He says the sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron. 
and with a point of a diamond. Notice, God says, I'm writing their sin down. Matter of fact, I already wrote the sin down, Jeremiah, and I wrote it down with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond. In other words, I wrote it down with something permanently. Yeah, so their sin is written down in heaven and it's wrote down permanently. Think about it, ladies and gentlemen. Back in Jeremiah's day, they didn't have pen and paper like what we have today. But what they had, uh, they would often write things down on clay tablets. And what they would do, they would take a tablet, they would take some clay, they would form it into like a tablet, and then they would get something sharp, like a, a, a pen of iron, or they'll get like a diamond. And then they would carve, they would write uh, in, on that table of clay. And when it would dry, it would be permanently wrote down. It, it, it's, it's just like uh, today when we see somebody pouring uh, some uh, cement there on the sidewalk. Every now and then you'll see somebody go and they take something sharp and they'll write something down. They may write the name of something down in that wet concrete. But when that concrete dry, whatever they wrote down has been permanently written there. It's written in concrete. God says that their sin is written in heaven. But God didn't stop there. God says their sin is also written on the table of their heart. Notice, God says, I won't forget it because I wrote it down in heaven. But he says, I won't let you forget it. He won't let Judah forget it because he says, I'm going to write it down on the table of their heart. In other words, God says, I'm going to write it down on their conscience. Their conscience won't let them forget it. But then God goes on further. He said, and upon the horn of your altar, God says, uh, where they perform their sacrifices to their idol gods, God says, I'm going to write it down there. So whenever they see that idol, that's going to remind them of what they used to do. It's just like when you see an old boyfriend or an old girlfriend, it reminds you of what y'all used to do. And then notice what he says here. He says, I won't stop there. I'm going to write it down uh, permanently. It's going to be a permanent record in heaven, but it's going to be a record there even on your conscience. But he said, I'm also writing it down on the horn of the altar. But then notice in verse 2, he says, while their children remember their altar and their idols by the green tree upon the high hill. He says, the children is going to remind you of your sin. Why? Because the children participated in family worship when they was worshiping those false gods. So God says, I'm going to have to judge the nation because the nation has a sinful heart. In the same way, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that America is a candidate for the judgment of God because America is a nation with a sinful heart. Well, if somebody asks you, uh, what is the number one sin in America? I mean, what one thing would God have to judge America for? I believe it's also the sin of idolatry. Yeah, because the thing about idolatry is we have idols in our lives and we won't let nothing separate us from our idols. And just like Judah was breaking all the Ten Commandments, I, you can see the same thing happening today in America. We're breaking all the Ten Commandments in order to get to our idol. And see, the thing about what makes it so bad, ladies and gentlemen, is what God does. God has set up 
four institution. Three of them is on the outside and one is on the inside to help us uh, uh, stay away from sin, to keep us uh, from falling into idolatry. But we in America, we are rebelling, ladies and gentlemen, against the institution of God. Uh, what are the institutions of God? Well, number one, we are rebelling against our own conscience. Well, you can see, ladies and gentlemen, right up here on this stage, I have some chairs that are laid out. This, these chairs this morning are acting as roadblocks. I have two chairs here, one chair here, I have two chairs here, I have three chairs here, I have four chairs here. And so all of these things, they act as roadblocks. And so God has set up a conscience to keep us from our idols or to try to keep us from sin. But if you are so bent towards your idol, you will kick against your conscience and knock your conscience out of the way and ignore your conscience. But thank God, thank God, thank God that God has set up another institution called the home. And God, original institution, he set it up with a man and a woman. He gave us two. But you can be so rebellious that you kick against your mama and your daddy and you go on and you rebel against them moving towards your idol because you won't let nothing separate you from your idol. But thank God, thank God, God has another institution that would act as a roadblock and that institution is called the church. And so we come in contact with the church and the church reminds us that uh, thou shalt have no other God before me. It reminds us that uh, worshiping idols is wrong, but we can rebel even against the church. And we won't let the church stand in our way. But thank God, thank God, God has another institution. And this institution is called government. God has given the, us the government. And here in America, uh, we have the uh, Congress, we have the president, we have the Supreme Court, and then we have police to enforce what Congress, the laws that Congress has come up with. But we can be so rebellious, ladies and gentlemen, that we'll rebel even against this, and we'll kick it on out of the way. As a result, we won't let nothing separate us from our idols. And see, anything can be an idol. Uh, food can be an idol, just like I got peanut butters and crackers here. People will steal and kill for over peanut butters and crackers. People will steal and kill for even over tennis shoes. People will steal and kill in order to have their music. People will steal and kill in order to have their television set. They won't let nothing separate them from their idols. They will disobey their conscience. They will disobey their mama and daddy. They will disobey the church. They have rebelled against the government authority in order to have their idol. And the big thing that's happening today, ladies and gentlemen, the, the big idol is we done made the president seat, the seat of the president. We done made that the big idol. Everybody today, they want this seat here. We want to put our man in this seat. And we are willing to lie, to cheat, to steal in order to get our man in the seat. And so what we got going on in America today, we got a big fight that's going on today. And people are willing to do whatever they need to do in order to that their man can be there 
in the White House. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we are living in a day and time where we got a sinful nation. We have a sinful heart. And, well, you say, well, pastor, uh, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to just let the police kill us then? I mean, they, uh, they shooting at us, they killing us, shooting us in the back. What are we supposed to do then, pastor? We're supposed to do what we always supposed to do. Number one, which should be trusted in God. But then number two, we try to work within the system. That's how Martin Luther King then was able to get the civil rights legislation passed, they was able to work within the system. And that's what we got to learn how to do. We got to learn how to work together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We got to learn how to work the system and trust Almighty God. Because regardless what somebody done done, you can't take vengeance in your own hands. See, the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay said the Lord. So you're going to have to trust God. Why is that? Because even though somebody may have gotten shot, God saw that. That's, and look, look right here in the text. Uh, go back up into chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 18 says, uh, 17 says, for mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hidden from my face. Neither is there iniquity hidden from mine eyes. God says, I see everything that's going on. God's, God is watching the racial profiling that's going on. Every time somebody's pulled over unfairly, God sees that. Every time uh, somebody is mistreated by a police officer or somebody, God sees that. Uh, whatever happened, uh, somebody done got shot, somebody done got killed. God, he sees that. And notice what he says. He says, I'm keeping a permanent record of it there in heaven. And do you think that person is going to have a good night's sleep? No, they won't even have a good night's sleep because God said not only is I'm writing a permanent record down there in heaven, but I'm going to write it down there in their heart. And they won't be able to forget it. And so this is why Mama and them used to sing that old uh, song about how be careful little eyes what you see. And then they would say be careful little ears what you hear. Be careful little hands what you do. Be careful little feet where you go because there's a God above and he's looking down in love. So be careful little feet where you go. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we are living in a nation that's got heart trouble. It's got a sinful heart. But not only that, uh, God told Jeremiah that the nation has a departed heart. The nation has a departed heart. Look, look here at verse number five. He says, thus said the Lord, curses be the man that trusted man and make it flesh his arm. And whose, here it is, heart departed from the Lord. Notice what God says. Cursed be the man that trusts in man. Curse. What's a curse? A curse is when you don't open the door to evil. It's evil wishes or uh, evil invitation. It's where you done invited evil into your life. And notice what he says. Uh, Curses is the man uh, that trusted man and make it flesh his arm. In other words, you trusting in the power of man rather than trusting in the power of God. He says that the problem is is you are putting your faith in the wrong source. He says, uh, uh, when you're putting your faith in man, then you're getting off the main road. You're getting on the wrong road now. And notice what happened, he says, when you get on the wrong road. In verse number uh, six, he says, for he shall be like the bush in the desert. 
and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabit. Notice what he says. You're going to be like a bush. In other words, a lit tumbleweed. Uh, you remember those old westerns and sometime on those westerns you would see those, uh, they would have those ghost towns and everybody done abandoned the town and you'll see the tumbleweed, you'll see the tumbleweed, uh, uh, the wind blow the tumbleweed this way, woo, and then the tumbleweed blows back. Then the tumbleweed goes this way. Then the tumbleweed, it goes this way. In other words, the tumbleweed is just going with the wind. It's, in other words, it's a picture of instability. God says, when you put your trust in man, you're going to be an unstable person. And notice what he says you're going to end up. He says and you're going to end up in the desert. And you shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched place in the wilderness and salt land and not inhabit it. He said you're going to end up in a dry place. And the, the thing about it, and he says it's a place where they don't even put some salt there. Uh, a lot of times when the enemy uh, would conquer some land, a lot of times what they would do, they would go ahead and pick all your crops, take all your crops, and then after they done took all your crops and stuff, they would uh, spread it down, pour it, uh, salt all around so that nothing would ever grow there again. So even if you try to grow something there, nothing won't grow there. Notice God says, this is the plight of the person that put their trust in man they're going to end up in a dry, unfruitful place. But notice what he says, too. He says, if you would have just stayed on the main road, you would have ended up in a fruitful place. Look at verse number seven and eight. He says, blessed is the man who trusted in the Lord and whose hope the Lord is, for he shall be like a tree. Planted by the waters, and that spread out her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaf shall be green, and shall not be anxious or worried in the year of drought, neither shall uh, cease from yielding fruit. Notice here, that's the opposite. God says, if you trust in man, you're going to be like a little tumbleweed. But he said, if you trust in me, you'll be just like a tree planted by the rivers of water and your leaves won't even wither. And when hard time come, you don't have to worry because you got a source that will supply, a source that won't ever fail and your fruit will constantly be yielding. And so God says, uh, you're going to miss out on your blessings by having a departed heart. When I look at America today, I see America is a nation with a departed heart. Uh, when you look at television today, you see a nation that done got off of the main road, a nation that's not going towards God, but a nation that is veering off the path and is going away from God. As a matter of fact, what is the number one popular group in America today? Now, a lot of people may say, the most popular group in America today is the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is the most popular group in America. Well, they got a lot of folks, it's a lot of Democrats, but they are not the number one most popular group, not today. Uh, somebody else may say, well, it's the Republican Party. Well, they got a lot of Republicans, but they are not the number one popular group, not today. The, most popular 
group in America today is the Black Lives Matter group. Yeah, people are jumping on the bandwagon just like fleas on a dog today. They are jumping on the bandwagon. They are the number one popular group in America today. Now, it wasn't like that last year. Last year, they probably weren't even in the top 10. But this year, they're up there at number one. Why are they up there at number one? Because, see, last year, a lot of people weren't joining them because they looked at them at like a hate group. They say that, well, they hate the police. They, uh, particularly when they first started out, they was marching and I got uh, uh, some tapes and stuff how uh, uh, they would be going down the street talking about uh, kill the police. Uh, matter of fact, they didn't say police, they say kill the pigs and fry them like bacon. Kill the pigs, they call the police the pigs, and they say fry them like bacon. And so they, they hated the police, but they also hated the traditional family. Uh, they're all for the LGBTQ uh, movement. As a matter of fact, some of the founders uh, of the Black Lives Matter, a couple of those ladies, uh, they are lesbians. So they are against their traditional family, and they have distanced themselves from the church. Uh, as a result, a lot of church folks, they didn't hardly have nothing to do with the Black Lives Matter. But this year, uh, everybody, even the black church, is jumping on board uh, this year with the Black Lives Matter. Well, what done changed? Did Black Lives Matter change? No, they didn't change, but we changed. What happened since the death of George Floyd? When we saw that white police put his uh, knee on that man's neck uh, for so many minutes, that bothered us. And as a result, we said something needs to be done. I mean, all of our hearts ached when we saw that. And so uh, as a result, uh, Black Lives Matters was doing something, so we jumped on the Black Lives Matters banquet because since they was uh, uh, fighting this thing, we said, let's jump on board and uh, help them. But my question is, ladies and gentlemen, is Black Lives Matters distracting us from what really matters? Yeah, uh, I, I want to know, do Black Lives Matters, are they really distracting us from what really matters? Because when I went out and got some statistics here uh, about police that uh, people that got shot by the police uh, during 2019 by the uh, statistic for research department, they said 370 white folks was killed by the police in 2019. 235 blacks was killed by the police in 2019. 158 Hispanics was killed by the police. Then 39 others was killed by the police and then 202 was killed, uh, unknown. Their race is unknown by the police. Now, when you look at all of this, uh, when Black Lives Matter be protesting, uh, for the most part, they only protest when somebody black done got killed. I didn't even know you had 370 white folks that done got killed by the police. I, I don't see nobody marching for that. 
I, I, I didn't even know that 158 of folks done got killed uh, by the police. Uh, I don't see nobody marching uh, for that. Uh, and then 39 other than then 202 that's unknown. Uh, I don't ever see nobody marching for that other than when black folks done got killed. If you just watch the television then, you'll just think that the police is, is just killing black folks and that's it. But the police is, is killing everybody, ladies and gentlemen. They're killing the whites, they're killing the blacks, they're killing the Hispanics, and they're killing others. They Asian folk, I mean, they're just killing everybody. So what I'm trying to say, they ain't discriminating. They ain't discriminated. When you watch television, they make you think that it's a race thing. It's a, uh, the police got it in for the blacks. No, uh, the police is killing all of them. They are not just singling out the blacks. They're killing the whites, the Hispanics, they're killing them all. And then when you really look at it, ladies and gentlemen, so that's why I'm asking the question. That's why I'm asking the question. Is the Black Lives Matters distracting us from what really matters? Because what really matters, all these people, whether they are white, whether they're Hispanics, or whether they're uh, Asian, uh, all these other lives also matter. Don't they matter? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, is Black Lives Matter distracting us from what really matters? Because when you really look at it, we got uh, over 3,000 to 4,000 blacks being killed every year by black on black crime. But don't stop there at that black on black crime. You got double of that that's being killed every year by white on white crime. And then you got a uh, half, about 2,000, 1,500 Hispanics that's killing Hispanics every year. And so in every uh, a racial group, everybody is killing everybody from on the inside. So to me, ladies and gentlemen, we just don't have a police problem, uh, a black on white problem, we got a murder problem in America. That's the problem, ladies and gentlemen. And so as Black Lives Matter, is they distracting us from all these other lives that also matter. And then as Black Lives Matter, is they distracting us uh, from uh, the abortions the, of the black babies. All these black babies are being aborted every year. Don't these little bitty babies, don't they lives matter? See, I ain't against us protesting. I'm not against us marching. But if we're going to march, let's start marching on what really matters. Let's march, ladies and gentlemen, about getting some jobs for our boys, our teenage boys and our young men, 20 and 30 year old men. They ain't got no jobs. Let's march and help them get some jobs so that they can get some homes and get off the street, ladies and gentlemen, and can raise them a family because that's what really matters. If we're going to march, let's march against the abortion clinics that's killing black babies uh, all year long, killing hundreds of black babies every day. Let's go ahead and march and close down some of these abortion clinics because those lit lives matter. Let's march against the school system, ladies and gentlemen, that are teaching our kids. They have these low performing schools and causing our kids to fail. Let's march, ladies and gentlemen, against the entertainment industry that looks at our black men as studs and they portrays our black women as trash. Let's march, ladies and gentlemen, against something that really, really, really matters. Let's just not stop at the white 
cops killing the black men. That matters, but there's a whole lot of other stuff that matters. So I'm asking a question today. Is Black Lives Matter, is they distracting us from what really matters? Because they're talking about now uh, defunding the police department. All right, go ahead and uh, defund the police department. But ladies and gentlemen, who you gonna call when you start having trouble there in your house? See, right here in America, the average household don't have no man there. So who gonna protect you? As a matter of fact, the average black house don't even have a gun in it. So who gonna protect you? Right now you're calling the police, but if they do away with the police, who you gonna call? Who you gonna call when somebody start acting ugly in your house? Who you gonna call when that boyfriend uh, uh, get ready to start wanting to beat up on you? Uh, who you gonna call when uh, somebody in your neighborhood is playing some loud music and disturbing the peace? Who you gonna call when they are trying to set up a drug house right across your street there and one of your neighbors? Who you gonna call when they got a sexual predator that keep driving around the block here trying to entice uh, one of the kids, a little boy, a little girl? Who you gonna call when they start shooting there in the neighborhood? Who are you going to call? Are you going to call a Rufus and, and let Rufus handle your business for you? Who are you going to call? Are, are you going to call James and, and let James handle the business? Well, you know what's getting ready to happen now. You're getting ready to have gang warfare because Rufus going to go and call his, his posse, and then James gonna go and call his, and next thing you know, we are gonna have the Crips and the Blood fighting it out all over again, and we ain't got no police. So who you gonna call, ladies and gentlemen? So we gotta, we gotta be wise as a serpent, because if anybody in America need the police, it's black folks need the police. Yeah, yeah. We need somebody to keep folks off of us. Amen. An amen goes there. Ladies and gentlemen, we better be very careful that we don't depart, that we don't go on and get on off the main road, because if we get off the main road, you end up getting something worse. You end up, you think it's bad now. It's going to even get worse. God said, because we're putting our faith in man, we're going to end up in a dry place rather than in a fruitful place. And so America has a sinful heart. We have a departed heart. We done got off the main road. But we also have a deceitful heart. See, my question is, now Judah knew that if they leave the law, they was going to end up in a dry place. God done warned them, you're going to end up in a dry place. Why? that they chase after these idols anyway. It's because they had a deceitful heart. That's the third kind of heart. They had a deceitful heart. Look, look right here in the text, verse number nine. It said the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? God said the problem is, is Judah got a deceitful heart. In other words, they say, yeah, I hear what you're saying, Jeremiah, but they ain't gonna happen to us. They ain't gonna happen to us. No, no, that's, uh, yeah, that may have happened to some of them other folks back there in Bible days, but that ain't gonna happen to us. See, that's because their heart done fooled them. They got a deceitful heart. The Bible says their, their heart is deceitful. It'll trick you above all things. Whatever you can compare, against your heart, your heart is worse than that. It says it's desperately wicked. That word desperate means it's extremely wicked. 
who can know it? You don't even know how bad your heart is. That's what God is saying. But God says, I know, verse 10, he says, I know, I the Lord search the heart, I test the conscience, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. God says, I know just how bad man's heart is. He said, because I search his heart. I know his heart from top to the bottom, inside out. And God says, and I try his conscience, even to give every man according to his work. So God says, I'm going to give to every man according to his work. Judah was a nation with a deceitful heart. Well, just like Judah, ladies and gentlemen, America is a nation with a deceitful heart. You can tell people, uh, if you go that way, it's good. you're going to end up in a dry place and they say, hey, not the kid. <laughs> no, that may, you, know, you don't have to worry about me, pastor. You don't have to worry about me, mama. You don't have to worry about me because the mama done tried to tell you, the preacher done tried to tell you. But we say, you don't have to worry about us. I know it happened to them, but it ain't no happen to me. See, that's the person who's got a deceitful heart. And see, we don't, we don't even know how deceitful our heart is. And see, the thing about here in America, just like Eve, the devil fooled Eve by filling our heart with lies, our hearts are constantly being filled with lies. But we don't know it's a lie. But it's a lie. But we don't even know it's a lie. See, that's just how deceitful deceit is. Uh, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. And it's desperately wicked. You don't even know. And see, like the media, when they be filling our heart with lies, we take it hook, line, and sinker. We take it. We take it. Why? It's just like me. When I was a little boy, but if it's on television, it's got to be true. It's on television. They ain't gonna let them tell no story on television. Yeah, you don't even know it. See, a person can tell you the truth, but it's really not the whole truth. And if it's not the whole truth, it's a half truth. And a half truth. God's going to look at it as a whole lie. For instance, for instance, I can tell you something. I can come to church one Sunday, stand right in this pulpit, and I can say, Sister Wilbur, don't fix me no more fried chicken. I ain't had no fried chicken in a long, long, long time. I don't even know what fried chicken tastes like anymore. Cause Sister Weber, don't fix me no fried chicken. Now, some of you who hear that, you're going to immediately stand up for Sister Weber. You're going to say, well, Sister Weber probably ain't got no time to fix Pastor Weber no fried chicken. After all, she's the first lady of the church there, and so she's doing a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff that nobody even hardly know about. And then she's still working on her job there at the school. And then she got to go home and clean. She's trying to take care of the house. And then she's trying to take care of uh, those grandbabies and stuff. And then trying to help out around the church. And then she even teaches a Sunday school class. So, Sister Wilbur, she needs some help. So, some of you, you're going to go ahead and say, I'm going to fix pastor some fried chicken. Yeah, that's what we go I'm going to do. And so, uh, when I show up the next Sunday, I I'm probably going to have three or four. Uh, 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 ladies that done fix me some fried chicken. I don't be eating fried chicken for the next two or three weeks. But then there's going to be some of you, you hear that comment that pastor say he ain't had no fried chicken, Sister Whippet ain't cook no fried chicken. You're going to start looking at Sister Whippet with a mean eye. You're going to start saying, what's wrong with that lady? She's starving that man. 
She know that man like fried chicken and she won't even fry a chicken. From, she won't even give him a drumstick. Matter of fact, cut that be, I bet she ain't even cooking for him. That may be why that man is losing weight and everything. Matter of fact, you used to sit back two rows behind her, but you said, I ain't even sit. Matter of fact, I better get as far as I can away from her because I just may pick up my Bible one Sunday and pop her side the head. She won't fix no fried chicken for that man. But then some of you, you said, wait a minute. I don't know, you know. I heard what Pastor said, Sister Whipper, don't fix no. I know, let me, let me call Sister Whipper. I got her number. Let me find out really what's going on. And you call and you find out and you ask Sister Whipper. Sister Whipper, Pastor said today that you don't fix him no fried chicken. Matter of fact, he said he ain't had no fried chicken in a long, long, long time. He said he can't even remember the last time that he had some homemade fried chicken from you. Well, what you got to say about that, Sister Whip? She said, that's, he told you right. I, I ain't fixed him no fried chicken. Uh, matter, matter, matter of fact, every time he eats some fried chicken, he don't know how to stop eating it. He won't just eat one piece. Uh, he'll eat two, three, four, uh, and th then go back and get him some more. He just, uh, and just eat up all the fried chicken. And then the next thing you know, later on that night, he come, Mary, if we got any alka salsa, my stomach, my stomach I got too much grease. Uh, either he'll come talking about he got a headache, he, he digs and stuff. Come check my blood pressure, check my blood pressure. My, I think my, my blood pressure done went on up here, Sister Will, but help me, help me here. And so I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear that no more about his blood pressure. I don't want to hear about his stomach. So uh, neither do I not fix him any fried chicken. I don't fry no food there for him. Uh, I, for, for the most part, I try to bake everything for him. I try to, try to bake it and try to stay away from uh, the, all that greasy food. Cause I mean, even though he like it, it don't like him. See. If you did not go and talk with Sister Wilbert and, and get the other side, then you gon' just only hear one side, and because you only heard one side, you gonna be brainwashed. You could have easily been deceived. And that's what's happening, ladies and gentlemen, in America. We often are just hearing one side. And as a result, we are being deceived. The Bible says, if you really want to know the truth, hear the other side. Uh -uh. Old folks used to say there are always two sides to every story. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, you don't want to be deceived. And are we being deceived here, ladies and gentlemen, in America? Particularly as it relates to defunding the police. Are we being deceived, ladies and gentlemen? Because why are they now bringing it up to defund the police? They weren't talking about defunding the police when the Ku Klux Klan was in charge of the police department in the 1950s and uh, they weren't talking about it when the Ku Klux Klan was in charge of a lot of these police departments in the 1960s. They weren't talking about it when the Ku Klux Klan was in the, uh, charge of the police department in the 1970s uh, or the 1980s. Uh, but when black folks start getting in charge of the police department in the 90s and the 2000s, and I said the other uh, Sunday in almost every major city, every major city today is ran by black folks because you done had a white flight. The whites done left the city and now the blacks done came to the city and now you got black males and you got uh, black uh, city councilmen, you got black uh, chief of police, you got black uh, fire chief, but now they would have got black people in charge. Now they saying we need to defund the police department. Ladies and gentlemen, are we being deceived? Are we falling for the okie doke? Why are they wanting to change the rules when black people get in charge? Uh, are we falling 
for the okie doke. You know, I said how the white, there was a white flight, but what you have now, you have a lot of the liberals whites, they are coming back to the city and they are using black people to take black people down. And they are paying black people to take black people down. And so basically what you got now, you got just like the crawdad syndrome. Every time black people try to come up, you got black people taking them down. Ladies and gentlemen, are we being deceived? Uh, see, we don't even know that just how we been deceived because the heart is deceitful above all things is desperately wicked who can know it matter of fact you don't even know what's in your heart until the squeeze is on see David thought that his heart was right until the squeeze was on when his uh, Bathsheba showed up in his life see uh, uh, Judah uh, he thought that his heart was right until somebody offered him 30 pieces of silver and he ended up selling Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. Peter thought that his heart was right until the squeeze was on him and they pointed at Peter and they said he was one of the disciples and Peter says, no, I'm not. I never knew the man blankety blank and blankety blank. See, you don't know what's in your heart until the squeeze is on. You can have a sinful heart. You can have a departed heart. You can have a deceitful heart. You don't know how bad your heart is until the squeeze is on. Somebody asked the question, well, is there any help for a troubled heart? Yes, there is some help for a troubled heart. But it starts not on the national level, but it starts on the individual level. Look right here at verse number 14. It says, Jeremiah prays, it says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Notice, Jeremiah is praying for himself. He's not praying for his country, even though his country has a sinful heart. Uh, he's not praying for his country, even though his country has a departed heart. He's not praying for his country, even though his country has a deceitful heart. He's praying for himself. It starts with him. He said, hear me, oh Lord, and I shall be. He said, if you do it, if you do it, if you do it, God, then I know I'll be healed. Then he says, and save me, and I shall be saved. He said, if you save me, God, if you do it, not my mama, not my daddy, or my sister, or my brother, uh, a doctor, or a politician, but if you do it, God, oh, it'll be done. Listen, if we're going to change America, it's not going to start by just trying to change the White House are trying to change who sits in the courthouse, uh, trying to change uh, uh, who sits there at the schoolhouse, but it's going to change because of who's at your house and the change done started at your house. Notice what he says, heal me. And that's how we need to be praying, Lord. Uh, 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 ladies and gentlemen, we need to be praying, heal me, Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved. That's how we should be praying today, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it starts on an individual level if we are going to be saved. If we want to see our nation saved, if we want to see our nation change, it starts with you and it starts with me. If we want to see change take place. Well, how do God heal? Is God going to heal us by putting some sad on it? He going to put some ointment on it and say, hopefully, hopefully that's healed. Uh, is God going to heal our troubled heart by blowing on it? <sighs> uh, is God going to heal our troubled heart by kissing on it? You know how mama used to kiss 
the hurt away. Is that how God is going to do it? Is he going to try to kiss the hurt away? Or is God going to put a band-aid on and say, we need to cover it up. We need to cover it up. Is God going to try to cover it up with a band-aid? How is he going to heal a troubled heart? God is not going to try to blow our troubles away. He's not going to try to kiss our troubles away. He's not going to put a band-aid on it and try to cover it up. Oh, because the problem is too severe. Matter of fact, because we got an extreme problem. The Bible says that the heart is extremely wicked. Because our heart is so extremely wicked, God had to take extreme measures by sending forth his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God had sent Jesus Christ to die on Calvary's cross in order to shed his blood and his blood can wash away all of our sins. His blood can deal with a sinful heart. His blood can deal with a departed heart. His blood can deal with a deceitful heart. Oh, that's why Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was laid upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. If you want Jesus Christ to heal your heart today, Jesus can fix it, ladies and gentlemen. If you got a sinful heart, Jesus can fix it. If you got a departed heart, Jesus can fix it. If you got a deceitful heart, Jesus can fix it. That's why the songwriter said Jesus can fix it for you. He knows just what to do whenever you pray just let him have his way and Jesus will fix it for you. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for who you are. Take this message and use it to bring on and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Wow, 
ladies and gentlemen. We had another wonderful service today. Thank you so kindly for joining us today. I tell you, it's just like the old folks say, I got happy, my soul got happy, and I thought we was gonna stay all day. But uh, we never like to leave the broadcast without giving you an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior. So if you would like to receive Jesus Christ as your personal savior, just bow your head and pray this prayer with me. Father, I have sinned and come short of your glory. Forgive me of my sins. I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord and I believe with all my heart that you raised him from the dead. Thank you for saving me. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, God bless you. Welcome to the family. Go tell somebody about that decision that you have made. Also, connect yourself with a good Bible-believing teaching church. If you don't have a church home, we would love to have you as a member of the exciting Bible Way Community Baptist Church right here in Irving, Texas. Uh, my announcer will have some contact information at the close of the broadcast. All right, thank you again for joining us. And as always, remember that God love you, and so do I, and there's nothing you can do about it. God bless. Have a good day in the Lord.